Hi, my name is Avril Sorter and welcome to Conducting Cisco Unified Wireless Site Survey. In this lesson, we're going to talk about a Layer 2 survey. So a Layer 1 Site Survey is all about trying to identify the interference sources, deciding whether or not you can overcome them, and then based on whether you can overcome them or not, deciding on the best frequency channels that you'll be able to deploy the access point on. The Layer 2 survey follows the Layer 1 survey, and it talks about how to position your access points to meet the required coverage and capacity requirements of your customer. So in this lesson, we're going to start talking about how you'd go about performing a Layer 2 site survey. And to do that, first of all, we're going to talk a lot about what it means to define the edge of a cell boundary if you're doing data or voice or location wireless LAN. Then we're going to talk about how do you actually determine how to place the access point and what are the different techniques for doing that. Then we want to talk about best practices that are recommended when you conduct your Layer 2 site survey. So let's first talk about how you perform a manual Layer 2 site survey. And because it's manual, it can be a little bit time consuming. However, I'd always recommend that if you've never done a site survey before, you start with a manual site survey before you start looking at how can I automate the site survey using more sophisticated tools, such as the Air Magnet Survey Pro. So after having done the Layer 1 survey, you should feel really comfortable about what the RF environment is and the different interference sources. Now remember that if you're conducting the layer 1 survey and the layer 2 survey potentially days if not weeks apart, there may be something that you're not aware of, like there may be a source of interference that you didn't detect that's now present. So always bear that in mind when you go and do your layer 2 survey that the radio environment could have changed. But the Layer 2 survey is all about working out the best place to position your access point. And when we talk about positioning the access point, we're going to talk about the cell boundary. This defines the area within which you can actually connect to the access point and have viable communications. What that means is you need enough signal strength to be able to demodulate and decode the signal over the noise level that's present in that band. But looking at signal strength and noise level alone is not enough. For good communications, you want to make sure that you're at the desired packet error rate. Now the desired packet error rate can actually vary for different applications. But if you're doing voice, Cisco recommend that your packet error rate does not exceed 1%. And bear in mind here, I'm talking about packet error rate. So I'm talking about your TCP IP packets. So once you've got your cell boundary that then defines where you can get good communications, the other thing you need to worry about is the interference between two cells that are operating on the same frequency channel. And of course, we call that co-channel interference. And you need to measure that and make sure that your cells that are operating on the same frequency channel are far enough apart. This chart here is looking at the recommendations from Cisco if you're deploying an 80211 network for data only, so not for voice or location-based services. And what you want to be looking at is you want to be looking at your receive signal strength. Now, bear in mind that your receive signal strength will actually fluctuate. So you want to be looking at not just the minimum receive signal strength, but the average receive signal strength. Now, this table provides the minimum RSSI and the minimum signal-to-noise ratio for a 20 megahertz channel and also for a 40 megahertz channel. And of course, that varies by data rates. So the higher the data rate, the higher the received signal strength must be in order to recover your ones and zeros. 
one of the things to note is that if you move to a 40 megahertz channel and intuitively you can understand that a wider channel would be more susceptible to interference and so in a 40 megahertz channel the RSSI is higher and the signal to noise ratio is higher than if you were operating in a 20 megahertz channel. So when you're deploying a wireless LAN for data only, you would determine what is your minimum data rate that you want to offer your users. And then you would determine, are you deploying a 20 megahertz channel or a 40 megahertz channel? And that would define the parameters that you would be looking for, for your cell edge, your cell boundary. Now, I took this table from the CCNP Wireless CUWSS Quick Reference Guide, but in fact, 802.11n will actually drop to lower data rates, and so a lower received signal strength and minimum signal-to-noise ratio is possible should you want the edge of your cells to be supporting the lower data rates. So one of the questions I often get asked is, well, what exactly is a cell boundary? So let's take a look at that next. Now let's talk about what it means to measure the cell boundary and also the separation between two cells that are operating on the same frequency channel. So in this illustration, I'm showing the 2.4 gigahertz band and I have three non-overlapping channels. So you can see I've deployed my access points on channel 1, 6 and 11. And as we know, if I'm deploying voice in the 2.4 gigahertz band, I need to have a cell overlap of 20%. And so when I'm looking at my cell boundary, I'm really looking at this edge here. So I'm looking for at what point does my signal, as I move away from the access point, drop below that required received signal strength. Because once it drops below that, then I would consider myself out of coverage for making a quality voice call. The other thing I need to look at is the distance here between two cells that are operating on the same frequency. And imagine if you would, I had a device that's operating on the cell boundary on this cell and another device that's operating on the cell boundary of another cell that's operating on the same frequency, then clearly when those two devices transmit, if they transmit at the same time, there's a risk that they're going to interfere with each other. And that's what we mean by co-channel interference. And so I need to overlap my cells enough to make sure I have connectivity for my voice calls. And I need to have them far enough apart that I'm not causing significant co-channel interference. Now, if you're doing a deployment for wireless data, we saw on a previous slide that if I'm looking at 14.4 megabits per second as my data rate for the cell edge, my received signal strength should be minus 82 dBm. But if we're looking at voice networks, I need it to be minus 67 dBm. Here you can see that for a data network, I need a signal to noise ratio of 11 dB. Whereas here for voice, I'm looking at a signal to noise ratio of 25 dB. So I really need to maintain a lot stronger signal and much higher ratio over the noise floor in order to maintain a quality voice call. Here's the 20% cell overlap that we were talking about in the 2.4 gigahertz band for voice. And again, lower if you're looking at 5 gigahertz, simply because in the 5 gigahertz band, there's the assumption that there's less interference in that band because there's less equipment that's actually built for deployment in that band. Over here for the voice, I've also indicated the channel separation. And this is between one access point and the cell boundary of another cell that's operating on the same frequency. Now, if you were designing your wireless network for location only, then you would need a minus 72 dBm as your received signal strength. Now, if you read the specifications, it'll actually say minus 75 dBm. But Cisco recommend for a site survey that you use minus 72 dBm. So it's given you an extra 3 dBm 
And the reason is, is because for location devices, you must always hear at least three access points. And as you know, the RF environment is continually changing. You know, people are moving around, interference sources may be intermittent. And so by giving you an extra three, that really protects you a little bit more for really rolling out and deploying a location-based network. Now you'll notice that the receive signal strength for a location deployment is actually higher than it is for a voice deployment. What that means is if you're deploying a wireless LAN that is to support both voice services and location services, then you should use the RSSI and signal to noise ratios recommended for a voice over wireless LAN. Of course, you still have to remember that in every location, it must be possible to hear at least three access points. A little snippet here. Also be aware that when you're deploying a wireless LAN for location, you also want to make sure your access points aren't too close. And the reason is, is that it determines the location in part by looking at the received signal strength from the Wi-Fi RFID device. And if multiple access points record the same signal strength, which can happen if your access points are too close to each other, then the location system can actually lose some of its accuracy. So it's not always better to have those access points close together. Now in radio, your RF environment, like we said several times, is continually changing. So your received signal strength will change as well. So what Cisco recommend is that you would use a 10 dB fade margin when you're doing a site survey. So for example, earlier we were looking at 802.11n if you're deploying it for data, and we said that if you were wanting to have 14.4 megabits per second on your cell edge and a 20 megahertz channel, you would need minus 82 dBm as your received signal strength. What Cisco is saying is add 10 to that, i.e. you'd actually set your receiver signal strength to being minus 72, not minus 82. The other thing that Cisco recommends if you're deploying a voice network is that you set mandatory data rates. So those data rates are illustrated in this table. So if you have legacy equipment, then it recommends that you set the mandatory data rate at 11 megabits per second and you do